Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this event. Uh, it's my great pleasure to have Karen Jennings uh, speaking to me this evening. I'm Shomok Ghoshal. Um, Karen is the author most recently of An Island, which was long listed for the Booker Prize 2021. And this event is uh, organized by Pan, Mac India, uh, Pan Macmillan India, which is Karen's publisher in India, and Champaka Bookstore, which is an independent women-run bookstore and children's library based out of Bangalore. They bring diverse stories and perspectives to readers through their books and events. They have an online store that ships across India where you can find all the books on their shelves, uh, including the book we are discussing this evening. Uh, you can order it from www.champaka.in. With that out of the way, uh, I'm absolutely delighted that we are talking about this very, very powerful and important novel I will try not to summarize it too much, but I'll let our conversation draw out the main features of the novel. But for those of you who haven't read it yet, and you must if you haven't, uh, I'll just briefly say that An Island is a kind of short novella, actually, set in an unnamed island uh, somewhere in the, on the coast of Africa. And uh, there are two uh, characters in it, mainly two characters in it. One, a lighthouse keeper who is marooned on this island, uh, whose job is to look after the lighthouse, and he's almost like the king of this, everything that he surveys, basically. And uh, one day, a castaway, uh, a kind of person who has sort of drowned, almost dead, lands up on the shores of the island, and he rescues him, and then discovers that this man and he don't have a common language. And over the next four days, the dynamics between their relationships evolve, and we also get to hear the in flashback about the life of Samuel, who is the lighthouse keeper. So this is the bare bones uh, kind of skeletal uh, plot summary of the novel. There is so much more to it that I feel quite ashamed giving you this very sort of short curtail summary, but I'm sure Karen will talk about it. But um, so welcome, Karen, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Thanks very much. It's I'm in Brazil. It's still morning here, but good evening to those of you over there who are, who are already on the other side of time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for joining us in the morning thank from your time. Uh, uh, so before we begin talking about the novel proper, you know, uh, I read somewhere that in an interview you spoke that the kind of the gist of the novel, you know, the plot of the novel came to you as though in a dream. You were in a residency in Denmark, I think, uh, and you sort of spoke about it. So if you can tell us about the genesis of the novel a bit before we get into it, that'll be great. Sure. So what happened, I, I was in Denmark at a writer's residency and I was having, yeah. I'm a great believer in naps. I have an afternoon nap every day, especially when I'm writing because um, I find my brain gets very tired and then I have a nap and I am revived. And so I was having my usual little nap and suddenly I had a vision in my in my sleep. It, I don't know if it was a dream or it's strange to to call it a dream because that makes it feel like it was created within my brain because it feels like it came from somewhere else. But it was a vision of an island with a lighthouse on it um, and on that island and an old African man and and just his face was very bitter and angry. And I, I woke up and I thought, oh, here's my next novel. Um, not knowing really what I would do with it other than there would be an island and a lighthouse and an old man. <laughs> um, and then at that time, there was a lot in the news about refugees in from Syria, the Syrian refugee crisis in Europe, and about the outrage um, in Europe, uh, the way that people were saying, oh, these, these, are, these are people, these are humans, bring them into our countries, let's save them, let's be good to them. Obviously, there was also the, the xenophobic and nationalistic response. But at the same time, in, in small little bits of news, there were African refugees who were drowning, boatloads of them drowning or being sent back from Europe, and there was no concern for them. Um, and it made me think about the the life of an African refugee, but not only 
in that dynamic of Africa to Europe, but within Africa itself, because within South Africa, we have a lot of xenophobia and we've had xenophobic riots. Um, and so I was really just thinking about what it is to be a refugee. And I thought about the island in relation to this refu refugee, but instead of making the novel about a refugee, because there have been extraordinary novels written about refugees before, I thought it might be more interesting for me to look at the other side, the person who is not wanting that outsider to come in. Right, right. You know, the island literature is actually one of my favorite kind of uh, yeah. subgenres, if you can call it that. And I, I always think of Tennyson's poem, Lotus Eaters, when I think of islands and how uh, Odysseus gets stuck in this island with his crew. And, you know, time comes to a standstill, nothing moves, the air is heavy and everybody's drowsy and sleepy. Yeah. Uh, and, I, and islands actually sort of conjure up that image for me and your island too is a bit like that. You know, it's kind of a, almost like a character in the novel itself. Yes. Yes. Uh, I wondered if you would like to talk about the island, uh, you know, the trope of the island in literature a bit. Right. Well, I wanted to be quite careful in a way because I didn't want it to be, um, I didn't want it to be a novel that was relying too heavily um, on, on other books. I did want to do something original for myself. I, I know that nothing is ever original anymore. We're influenced all the time. Um, but I didn't, it wasn't something that I thought about too much. And anything that did come through was very subtle and unconscious. Um, so all I really thought about for the island was that it had to be clear that this was, even though it's a fictional place, that it's very real in terms of the context of the book and that whether Samuel is there, whether the lighthouse is there, whether the refugee is there, that island stands there and it has a past and it has a future. So, so that, um, and there are things that happen within, within the novels such as um, previously dead bodies have washed up on the island and he has um, made them part of the island by stacking them um, under, under rocks and he has taken those rocks from the perimeter of the island and kind of changed its shape um, so that the island is, is like a character in that it's adapting to and, and being manipulated in a way by who is there and um, and how they use it. Previously, colonizers had used it or, or smugglers. Um, and then we have the lighthouse. And then there's also the, there's a weed that grows on this the island that tries to take over. And he's always trying to battle this weed to control it so that it's almost the relationship is one of control who gets to control whom the island controlling him or him controlling the island right i think this idea of control and power is very central to the book uh, which i'll come to later but um you know this that you that you mentioned the island in almost the sort of human terms that there is a kind of tussle going on between uh, samuel and the island is sometimes an ally and sometimes an opponent yes. that's really really a powerful idea and uh, when I spoke of influence, it was more like, you know, I was thinking of writers like, uh, I mean, Robinson Crusoe is a classic example of, you know, an island becoming larger than life. Yes. But also um, Jane Kutsia's Four, for instance, which is again yes. a kind of takeoff on Crusoe. And yes. I know that uh, you have written, you've worked on Kutsia's uh, books for your dissertation, uh, you know. Yes. And I wondered you would like to talk about Kutsia's role in your uh, literary imagination, your life. <laughs> well, let me say this, that um, the first novel I read of Kutsia's was Foe, which is the one that is kind of a take on, on Robinson Crusoe. And um, it was when I was in my third year at university and um, we studied it as part of postmodernism. And I remember reading it because I have never been particularly interested in 
contemporary writing and, and postmodern writers or, or people writing now. I usually am attracted to older uh, writers. And so I read it and I thought this was, it was very eye opening to me. It was something extraordinary, the way in which um, something that had been very meaningful and powerful in the past, such as Robinson Crusoe, could then be reused and reinterpreted um, in a new way. Um, and then I did go on to do a master's degree on Kutsia, um, on his uh, female characters in, in his novels. And that was probably the worst thing I could have done because it, it destroyed my enjoyment of his writing. And um, I haven't been able to read him since then. I think the last novel of his I read was Slow Man, which was I think 2007 or something. And I, I, can't, I can't go back to him maybe one day again. Um, so if anyone is listening, who's thinking of what to do their masters on, don't choose someone that you admire, please. It will destroy it. <laughs> I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I, I'm a big fan of Kutsia and I can't imagine. And even at one point, I had sort of thought about writing my PhD on him, but never did. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad that I kind of yeah. thought about that. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so um, so uh, those who are listening can always send in their comments, questions, anything they want to say on the chat. But uh, we will also take periodic breaks and I'll have Karen re read from uh, some of a sort of novel. Uh, Karen, would you like to read something now? And then maybe sure. we can return to the conversation. Okay. Um, the section I'm going to read now is actually a part that doesn't take place on the island. It's a memory that he has, which is from when he, he was in prison for a very, very long time. Samuel, I mean, for uh, his political activities. Um, and so this is what happens to him when he's released from prison eventually after uh, a very long time. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to, to find where I was, where I wanted to read from, excuse me. That's fine. Above him, a woman was asking, are you all right, uncle? Her feet were white in places, white with cracking and dryness. Yet when he looked up, her round face was damp, her fat rolls marked out on her dress by patches of sweat. She struggled to bend down over her belly and panted a little as she said, come uncle, you can't lie here in the dirt. She helped him up with wet hands. His fingers slipped and he thought he might fall, crack his skull on the wall behind him. Where are you going? Samuel pointed at the wall. The woman wiped the sweat from her face and spoke slowly. No, uncle, that's the palace, the prison, you see. You've just come from there. I was across the road. I saw them release you. Yes, I live there. No, uncle, you can't live there anymore. You're free now. You can't go back. Don't you have a family? Where was your home? Can't you go there? I don't know. The woman put her damp arm around him led him across the street to sit on a cinder block under a tarpaulin spread for shade. Beside the block was a pile of empty sweet wrappers, yellow, bright pink and blue, and kebab sticks stained in places where there had been meat. The woman handed Samuel a plastic bottle, murky with fingerprints, and he drank the lukewarm water while she wafted a dirty rag at a row of cooked sheep's head, heads laid out on greasy newspaper. Behind her, a washing line hung black with cuts of meat, braces of chicken's feet, and calves' tongues. Flies rose lazily as she waved the rag, then returned, were waved away again, and finally allowed to settle down to feed. How long were you in there, uncle? the woman asked. I can't remember. Maybe, maybe it was 25 years. I don't know. It's no wonder you're confused. I'm not confused. It's my home. A prison can't be your home. She passed him a skewer of dark meat. Eat this. He took it and chewed with difficulty, his remaining teeth loose in his mouth. He hunched in on himself as he sucked at the meat, 
moving away from the onslaught of buildings and people, the roar of traffic and motion. None of it had been there before he'd gone inside. It had all been quiet then, mostly grazing land. Sometimes, between the picks and sledgehammers, he might have caught the lowing of cattle, a herd boy's whistle or song. It was gone now, only this in its stead, this chaos, bordered by grinning sheep's heads as he chewed and chewed and chewed, waiting to remember to swallow. That's really powerful and vivid. And uh, for those who are listening, this is really like, uh, you know, one of the most gripping sort of realist novels that I've read in a long time. Um, we, I, I wanted to actually ask you, Karen, about your choice of writing in this very uh, stark realist mode. And I have some of your other books also lined up and on my Kindle to read. And I see that all your writing has been mostly in the kind of novella short form, kind of shorter form rather, um, that space. And I wanted to ask you if that was something deliberate that you do as a writer. Well, it is, I suppose it is deliberate in, in a number of ways. One of which is that I write by hand still because I really feel strongly about what words are being chosen and how I choose a word and how a sentence looks. I write each sentence many, 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 many times. And um, I'm very careful about the words I choose so that it takes me quite a while to write something um, by hand and then to put it on the computer, then rewrite it again. And, you know, it's a very long process. Um, and I also feel that if you, if you look at a, novels these days, they can be incredibly long. And a lot of the time, so much of it can be cut out. It's, it's um, superfluous. There is so much that is not needed, so much explanation or that I feel is two things. It's one of it is simply done for the author's own pleasure that they are just enjoying the act of writing. And so they, they write, but, but the words have no real value. And the other thing is that the writing is more for show, that they're showing the reader, look what I can do. But again, there's no value or meaning to the words. And so I really want to make each word count. And um, that often means that a piece will, uh, a piece of writing will be shorter. Um, and I think that there is more potency there that the, the shorter the better, short and sweet, <laughs> I suppose. I, I agree with you, and it leaves a lot uh, on the reader's imagination. And I think that's a very generous, you know, act on the part of the writer that you trust your reader's intelligence enough to build up whatever you are not telling them. And that yeah. I was constantly confronted with while I was reading uh, your book. Um, I also wondered, um, you know, like the current uh, politics of publishing is such uh, that, especially if people writing from, say, Commonwealth countries, African writers all of them have this kind of burden on them almost to show and explain their cultures to the world. So that readers follow more easily, you know, what's going on. And it's, this is mostly targeted at American readers who are probably not as aware of the other readers as yeah. are. Um, uh, we, for instance, in India, grow up reading a lot of diverse texts uh, if we are reading in English uh, yes. in school. And we don't need that kind of handholding and introduction. But in this book, particularly, I feel that you resisted the urge to set up that context, you know, the political, social, the national context of a story. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes, um, it's I, I don't ever like that a text should become like a Wikipedia entry where it is telling you everything you need to know, all the history, all the information. I like that it should feel more natural, that the information that is there is seamlessly included. But also, as you were saying, that a lot of it is left to the reader's imagination and the reader to consider what what their feelings are and what their, what their reaction to it is, so that it becomes, even though it is a, a novel set 
in Africa that it becomes something universal um, so that it isn't just just a novel about Africa for Africans so that it is something for everyone and um, so I um, it I also I also am very much aware of resisting that urge to define something because and this is partly to do with the difficulty of being a white a white African. I have a very complicated relationship with Africa or Africa has a complicated relationship with me, um, not, not only within South Africa where we had apartheid, but you know, the continent as a whole, which was sliced up, divided by, by European nations and taken for themselves and really brutalized and abused in many ways. So what is what happens if I come along and I say, this is Africa, this is what it is? And I'm very careful not to do that. I don't ever want it to seem like I am saying, I, as a white descendant of colonizers, have the right to tell you what this what this place is. Um, it's really more about me trying to understand a long history and find where I might belong in it and and try and take part, participate, but never take it for myself. Right. It's so fascinating that you mention uh, the point about belonging because I was almost coming to it um, in the sense that, you know, again, I was thinking of Elizabeth Costello, Kutsi's character. And uh, in Elizabeth Costello, the novel itself, uh, you know, uh, th there is that chapter, I think, which is called The Novel in Africa, where uh, Elizabeth Costello is a white African writer and she is speaking at a conference and then She's confronted by a Nigerian writer called, I think, Egudu, who says that, you know, uh, you are not the representative of the tradition of the African novel because, you know, there is orality and all these African elements to our writing and yours is quite different from what we do. And there is this huge conflict that breaks out about which tradition does she belong to? So I wondered whether you have thought about uh, your place in a certain tradition of writing. I mean, not that every writer has to think of that question, but... If you have, uh, what would that tradition be? I have thought about it and I've thought about it with, it's been an uncomfortable thing for me to think about because let me put it this way. I was incredibly touched. I, I continue to be touched by the amount of support and encouragement and pride that I got from people across Africa and the and the diaspora um, about my success being on on the book along list as an African author. And that was very heartwarming for me. But then I also thought I don't want to become the representative. I don't want to, it to be me alone because I'm not the representative. There can never be one representative, not of a country uh, or, or a continent like Africa. I mean, there's so many countries in it. There's so many languages. There's so many cultures. There's no way of defining it. And to say that I am a voice for Africa or or representative of anyone that that becomes derivative and um, and dangerous and insulting. Um, so, for me, I only want uh, what I want is not to be part of any. I don't want to be defined as any one thing. I only want to be. Karen Jennings, who is a South African author who writes about the things that matter to myself. Um, and hopefully those things will matter to other people. Um, but I, I certainly don't want to place myself on a pedestal and say, here it is, here I am, this is Africa. No. Right, right. Um, you know, one of the things which you, it's constantly sort of occupied my um, imagination while I was reading your book is this constant 
operation of power at various levels. You know, we spoke about the island versus Samuel and uh, then Samuel versus the rescued person. Uh, this constant dynamics of power that build up. Uh, and actually, I mean, I have an extension of this question, which I'll ask later, but if you could talk about this uh, premise of the power that you create, you know, it's almost like a fable that you create uh, of colonialism, of xenophobia, all the issues that you spoke about. Uh, what does this, uh, where does this come from and uh, how did you sort of come up with right. this structure? Look, um, it's a, it's such a complicated thing. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I tried to simplify it as best I could by taking the story of nations of, of colonialism and bringing it to this, this island and these two people. Um, so that not to diminish it, but so that I could focus on it more. Um, and so it goes back for me, um, particularly to um, what I mentioned before about the scramble for Africa in, in the 1880s, where the nations of Europe, there's a, a famous cartoon from the time where, the, where Africa is depicted as a cake and the, all the leaders of Europe are standing around it and they're, eat, they're slicing it up and each gets a slice of cake. And so um, I'm always thinking about that and what the consequences of that action was, how easily people decided to take something for themselves and what the effect is then on people continuing up to the present day. Um, so what is what happened to people um, in African countries uh, when the colonizers were in power and then the colonizers left and what was what was given to them. Um, in some con African countries, the colonizers left and destroyed everything. There was nothing left. And whereas in other places, there was a far more peaceful transition. But still, what do you have? You can't go back to a way before the colonizers and you can't go back to what it was like under the colonizers. So what it, what do you have to, to move forward with? It's a very difficult situation. And then you're trying new things. And unfortunately, in that vulnerable time, people come into power who are not, the, not interested in the, the best interests of the, the people, of the masses. They're interested in themselves. So we see the failure of democracy. We see the rise of the dictators. Um, we see independence movements and, and torture and abuse of people. Um, and, and in the end, what we have is a lot of violence and suffering and partly because that is what was taught with colonialism, violence and suffering. So I wanted to look at what the effects of that might be on an, on an individual. And I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to go on too much. It's it's a bit boring when someone monologues, but I, I do just want to say then that I also wanted to look at not only the individual, but how we as individuals are still influenced by the dynamics of power relations um, that, okay, it's very easy to say we have a, for example, I'm in Brazil and we have here a very nationalistic far right uh, president who's in favor of, of dictatorships and anti-vaccine and all sorts of things. Um, and so it's all very easy to say, blame the politicians. They are the nationalistic ones, but who is voting them into power and why are they voting them into power? And then take that to the small scale, you're at home and you see a foreigner coming in and living next door and having a good life. Where, meanwhile, you're struggling. So what is your reaction to that? And what? how do you behave towards them? How do you live in the world when that's going on around you? I think that's so well put. And this is precisely the impression I got when I was reading the book, that this is as much about you know nations kind of um, competing with each other for power, but also at a very individual level, we are all kind of proto-colonizers. There are, there are always people who are weaker than us and we like to exert our 
influence over them in whatever way we can. Yeah. And in in the case of Samuel and his, uh, you know, Man Friday like person uh, on the island, I feel it's even true because uh, you know I think uh, the fact that you didn't give them a common language made that experience even more visceral. Like at moment to moment, you don't know what's going to happen between them, you know, yeah. because um, not. I, I think language also sets up hierarchies, and we think that if you have language, you have power. But actually, the person who is also silent, who is not communicating with you except for gestures, yes. is equally powerful. You know. Yes, I think that's so true. In in the case of of this refugee or or whatever it is that has washed up on the shore, because he, um, because of his silence, because he's not able to communicate, he does have power because. Um, he becomes a threatening presence, not only in his physical presence, but because he's not able to communicate what he wants to say and and to we don't know anything about him. So that silence becomes very powerful indeed. I was also struck, you know, with the body language, that when he smiles, it could be a smile of menace and also it could be yeah. a kind smile, you know, and that left you on tender hooks throughout the book, I felt. Yeah. And I wonder, as a writer, like how was the experience of writing a book like this when two characters don't speak to each other in a in a normal, you know, kind of so-called normal sort of situation? I'll be honest, it it was hell. It was absolute hell. It was terrible. I woke up every day and I took the dogs for a walk. And I remember walking the dogs and saying to myself every morning, this book is going to kill me. This book is going to kill me because so little happens you don't have dialogue to hide away in you don't have intense interaction it's all very very subtle and um i remember i remember at one point i actually i thought i'm going to change it i'm going to change from an omniscient narrator to a first person narrator so that at least there's you can have Samuel having a dialogue with himself more. And I tried it and it just didn't work. It was a completely different book. And um, yeah, it was a great struggle. And I, I wrote and wrote many, many drafts of it. And um, simply just of a single paragraph, I would sit all day writing three sentences sometimes. So it was it was tough. <laughs> I can imagine. And I suppose if they actually had a language between them, uh, they could speak to each other. It would have opened up other kind of complexities. Yes. Probably yes. it would have been a longer book and a uh, different kind of story altogether. Yes, definitely. And and someone once asked me, I can't remember where or when, but they said uh, something about if I could rewrite the book now, what would I change? And I just thought there's no way to to rewrite it and and ever come up with the same book every time will be different because there are so many things that can be changed maybe they share a common language or maybe the the man that washes up is not a man maybe he's a woman or maybe samuel is young and the the refugee is old or you know there's all different ways of changing it so this is never the absolute finite version of of anything. This is one experiment of trying to understand a complicated issue. Right. Um, so I'll just remind everyone to send in questions, comments uh, on the chat box. And while they do that, would you like to read another passage maybe? Sure. Let me have a look here. All right, so <laughs> we've been talking a lot about the island and I realize I haven't actually got a section from the island. Um, so I will ask you, you can either have a section from the island or a section that's not from the island. I think let's have a section from the island itself. Okay. All right, so this is um, uh, a, a moment where the... Um, the refugee and Samuel are trying to communicate. 
The man laughed, showing his teeth big and white. He removed his hand from Samuel's chest, used it to point at his own, then slapped his heart with an open palm as he spoke a word. He repeated it twice, slowly, each time slapping his chest. He took care to enunciate the sounds, guttural, foreign, so that in its exaggerated way it became like a performance, someone growling for a child's amusement. Samuel exhaled. He understood it was a name, the man's name. He tried to reproduce it. Mmm, he said. The man made the first sound again. Mmm? The man repeated the word, nodding for Samuel to continue. Ngsh. But Samuel could not adapt his mouth to it. He shook his head, waved his hand in the air as though to clear it of the noise he had made. The man lifted a finger, bent down to write with it in the sand. It won't help, Samuel said. I can't read. I could once, just a little, but that's a long time ago now. I don't remember any of it anymore. Then he pointed at himself, spoke his name, and the man smiled. Sang wool, he said. Sang wool. Samuel nodded. The man gripped his shoulder and smiled again. Sang wool. Right. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, I also wanted to ask you, you know, the way I came to your book first was uh, through your interview to The Guardian, which was very powerful. Okay. And, you know, you spoke about your challenges as a writer, the very practical challenges of the life of the writer. Yes. And um, this is something I think a lot about because uh, I feel that as writers from uh, sort of less dominant cultures, less dominant publishing cultures, let's put it this way, uh, which published in English, we face a flurry of challenges in, in positioning ourselves in the world, in bringing out our work, in giving it some kind of life. Yeah. Um, would you like to talk about the publishing politics and you know the kind of challenges that you faced in mm -hmm. publishing this book? Because I know that you've been working on this for a long time. Uh, yes, it, it was a, it was an experience that um, was. I it led me to great despair. I'll have to be honest. Um, so I wrote this novel while I was a. Uh, Miles Morland Scholar. The Miles Morland Foundation is a foundation based in the UK and they give annual scholarships to African writers. And what the purpose of this is so that for that year, you don't have to worry about, you know, finding a way to pay the rent and put food on the table, that you can just focus on your writing. And it's an incredible opportunity for any writer. And I was very grateful. And after that year, they... Um, introduced me to uh, an agent who was um, who is a very big um, agent in the UK um, and he loved it um, but then he didn't really seem to be able to do much with it he sent it to a couple of publishing houses and then nothing happened for about a year um, and then and and the feedback I had received was that, uh, the novel was um, too, uh, too African and then also not African enough. I received uh, feedback it was too experimental. All the feedback said it was incredibly well written, but the gist of it was that it was too much of a risk that no one would buy it, no one would read it. And um, I had... With my previous books, I had tried very hard to get a, get published in South Africa because I am South African. It's where I would like to be published. Um, and I had never had any success and I had found a small publisher in the UK. And so when my agent had sort of just shoved the manuscript in a drawer, as it were, and forgotten about it, I started looking for small publishers Again, I sent. I did send it to a big publisher in South Africa. They they said no. There's no way people will read it. It won't make any money. And then I sent it to this small publisher in the UK and Holland House Books. And Robert, my my publisher, he loved it and immediately wanted to publish it. Um, 
but then we had a great deal of difficulty getting any interest in reviews or people writing endorsement quotes we we just couldn't get any interest in it at all um and it was basically forgotten um of course there was the pandemic as well that exacerbated the situation it was already a bad situation but that exacerbated it and then um and then if it had not been for the miracle of being long listed for the booker which really was an absolute miracle it was unexpected un unbelievable um the book would have been forgotten completely so i'm very grateful that that it was recognized well it's a really wonderful book and uh, i think i'm very surprised to hear that this whole response of this is too african and not african enough because the book doesn't really ground itself in any cultural context of course it can be any kind of autocratic culture where you know there has been a revolution and they, these instances are so ubiquitous around the world so i'm very surprised that that is that was one of the reactions i think um, that with with uh writers from africa there's a specific thing that is looked for there's a specific view of africa um and people want something that they can recognize as as africa as an africa they understand um and so yeah i suppose that's <laughs> that's part of the difficulty is that uh trying to to show that there's more than one one way of doing things exactly and it's the same problem that i think a lot of indian writers also have to grapple yeah. with that if your novel is not about you know the burning social cultural political issues of the day then uh it's not an indian novel if it's writing about say the rich elite in india it's yeah. not an indian novel yeah it's it's like they want only the stories of of poverty and hardship an african story should have a child soldier and and an indian story should have someone growing up in the slums and then in the end they conquer it and are wealthy and find love and happiness and fulfillment or they go to europe or america and are therefore fulfilled that's the story yeah that's the template actually mm. um i think there's a question um so nirika has posted this um curious to know if you drew inspiration from other fiction in writing this book and what are you reading currently um i uh, first i'll answer the last question first i'm reading jane air currently um i have read it many times but um my my publisher robert and i we were talking about it recently and so we're both reading it at the moment and having lovely discussions about it um and but i'm also reading uh, a novel by cora sandal who was a um oh gosh a norwegian writer from i'm i think this book was published in 1926 and but only tr translated into english in the 60s and it's called um alberta and jacob and it's extraordinary um did i draw inspiration from other works of fiction when when i am writing um i try not to read read fiction i i will read poetry or or non-fiction i try to stay away and i also do quite a lot of research beforehand so that i'm not um looking that, that i have a more clear idea of things in my mind um and so I didn't there was no specific text um and I try to remove that unless unless I were one day to be writing back to a text like for example with um Jane Kutsia writing back to Robinson Crusoe um if I were to do something like that but otherwise I try to not have that um in my mind right I think Robinson Crusoe is like his chalice that he carries around because his Nobel lecture was also he and his man which was basically another allegorical kind of <laughs> yeah. telling is there anything like that in your life a book which you sort of hold on to like a bible almost um there are books that i return to to often um but quite a few of them um and 
they are um it's it, i have one specifically and i'm sorry to tell you i'm not going to tell you its name <laughs> it's a very obscure book um and it's um from um eastern europe and um, but <laughs> it is something that i it, it's a book that is so brilliantly written obviously i'm i'm only reading it in translation but it's so brilliantly written that i've only been able to read it through completely through once in my life because i find it painful to read because it's so good right right i have a couple of more questions but i wonder if anybody else has posted anything else but while we wait for that uh, i'll just quickly ask you two questions one is uh, you know has afrikaans literature been of uh, any kind of particular influence on you as a writer you know oh well my mom is afrikaans and so i grew up bilingual um but more more just at home i haven't read that much afrikaans literature but i suppose there are certain certain books that have been fairly in, influential um one of them is a very famous uh south african novel um called fila sekund fila's child and it's an extraordinary book about um set in i think it's the 19th century uh or or at maybe the early 1900s where uh, a colored and in south africa colored is like mixed race um and it's it's an acceptable term it's not a pejorative term nope. um and so a colored woman is raising a white boy that she found one day sort of wandering around lost and then a magistrate um takes the child away from her and it's an extraordinary story about love and about family and about um what we have inside us naturally inside us searching for belonging and i think that has always stood out to me that novel about that that search to belong somewhere right right I'm not sure if there are any more questions, but um, in that case, I think I'll just ask you one last question before we wrap sure. up this session, well, which is basically to say that you know it's a wonderful thing that this book has been long listed for the Booker, and I'm sure, as you said, it's kind of changed your life in a way. But has that also brought in other kinds of pressure, anxieties, and worries about your future as a writer, in any way? Um, well, the first thing that it has done is that um originally the book was published as a fi 500 500 books the print run was 500 books now i i think there are you know thousands and thousands of copies being sold around the world um so just in terms of people reading me which is what any author wants is to be read it's not about fame and fortune at all it's about being read um so that's been extraordinary um and what the what also we've sold the translation rights and publishing rights all over the world just everywhere and what this has meant is that i have now the money to move back to south africa so by the end of the year i'll be moving back to south africa and i'll be back home um and which i can't wait for um and and in that sense, that hasn't been pressure. That has been um, incredible. That's to be able to go home for me is is uh, it's hard for me to put into words. Um, the pressure I I did feel was uh, wh when when the before the shortlist was announced, there was a lot of attention and a lot of media events and interviews and everyone wanting. In information and to talk to me and I thought that 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 did because I had come from obscurity to suddenly everyone wanted to talk to me that I found a bit challenging because I am quite a loner isolated kind of person um and so not to not to sound not to sound ungrateful but I was 
relieved that I didn't make the shortlist. And I actually did a dance of joy because I felt that I was free uh, because I have all the benefits. Um, I, you know, as I said, being read all over the world and people knowing knowing my name, but without the continuing challenge of of being wanted and and sought after. Uh, so at the moment, I'm not feeling any pressure. Probably when my next book comes out, I I might be quite nervous. I am busy working on it now, doing some final tuning tune ups before I send it to my publisher. Um, but at the moment, I'm I'm okay. At the moment, I'm good. I'm happy. <laughs> right. I think I, I also yeah. You you exactly sort of talked about the thing I was asking, which is basically you know once you. Uh, enter the mainstream of the commercial aspects of publishing in this way, it can have a lot of pressure on you as a writer, you know, to produce consistently and all of that. But I'm sure your next book will be wonderful too, and we are all waiting to read it. Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, this evening. It was really a pleasure talking to you, Karen. Thank you. It was so, it was really a pleasure talking to you. I really enjoyed your questions and the way that um, you engaged with the book. So I really thank you very much. And thanks Champaka and Pan Macmillan for organizing this event. And thank you everyone who joined in and listened to us.